Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Marcus. For those who doesn't know who I am, I'm a podcaster that will read you a random story twice a week. I'm also on Spotify as well, so feel free to go and check it out. I'll leave the link under the description box below. And today, I'll be here as usual to read you a story to help you fall asleep. And hopefully, you will have a good dream. So, without further ado, let's begin our story. Tonight, I'll be reading "The Fair with Golden Hair." This story is about a handsome courtier backs a princess to marry a king, but the princess falls in love with him instead. So yeah, let's begin our story. Also, this is a vintage fairy tale, and it may contain some violence. So listen for your own sake. Once upon a time, there was a king's daughter who was so handsome there was nothing in the world to be compared with her for beauty, and she was called the fair with golden hair. Because her looks were like the finest gold, marvelously bright, and fallen all in wrinkles to her feet, she always appeared with her hair flowing in curls about her, crowned with flowers, and her dresses embroidered with diamonds and pearls. However it might be, it was impossible to see her without loving her. There was a young king among the neighbors, who was a merry, very handsome, and very rich. When he heard all that was said about the fair with golden hair, although he had never seen her, he felt so deeply in love with her that he could neither eat nor drink, and therefore resolved to send an ambassador to ask her hand in marriage. He had a magnificent coach made for this ambassador, gave him upwards of a hundred horses and as many servants, and charged him particularly not to return without the princess. From the moment that the envoy had taken leave of the king, the whole court talked of nothing else, and the king, who never doubted that the fair with golden hair would consent to his proposal. Order immediately fine dresses and splendid furniture to be prepared for her. While the workmen were hard at work, the ambassador arrived at the fair one's court and delivered his little message. But whether she was that day out of temper, or that the compliment was not agreeable to her, she answered the ambassador that she thanked the king. But had no inclination to marry. The ambassador quitted the court of the princess, very low-spirited, and not being able to bring her with him, he carried back all the presents he had been the bearer of from the king. For the princess was very prudent and was perfectly aware that young ladies should never receive gifts from bachelors, so she declined accepting the beautiful diamonds. And the other valuable articles, and only retained in order not to affront the king, a quarter of pound of king English pens. When the ambassador reached the capital city of the king, where he was so impatiently waited, everybody was afflicted that he did not bring back with him the fairy of golden hair, and the king began to cry like a child. Endeavour to console him, but without the least success. There was a youth at court who was as beautiful as the sun, and had the finest figure in the kingdom. On account of his graceful manners and his and his intelligence, he was called Evident. Everybody loved him, except the envious, who were vexed that the king conferred favours upon him, and daily confided. To him, his affairs. Avenant was in company with some persons 
who were talking of the return of the ambassador and saying he had done no good. If the king has sent me to the fair with golden hair, say he to them carelessly, I'm certain she would have returned with me. This mischief makers went immediately to the king and say, Sir, you know not what Evelyn asserts, that if you had sent him to the affair of golden hair, he would have brought her back with him. Observe his malice. He pretends that he is handsomer than you, and that she would have been so fond of him that she would have followed him anywhere. At this the king flew into a rage, a rage so terrible that he was quite beside himself. Ha ha, he cried. This pretty minion laughs at my misfortune and values himself above me. Go, fling him into the great tower and let him starve to death. The royal guards hastened in search of Avenant, who had quite forgotten what he had said. They drag him to prison, inflicting a thousand injuries upon him. The poor youth had only a little straw to lie upon, and would soon have perished before a tiny spring that trickled through the foundations of the tower, and of which he drank a few drops to refresh himself, his mouth being parched with thirst. One day, when he was quite exhausted, he exclaimed with a heavy sigh, What does the king complain of? He has not the subject more loyal than I am. I have never done anything to offend him. The king by chance passed close by the tower, and hearing the voice of one he had loved so dearly, he stopped to listen, notwithstanding with those who were with him, who hated Evernant and said to the king, What interests you, sir? Do you not know he is a rock? The king replied, Leave me alone. I will hear what he has to say. Having listened to his complaints, the tears stood in his eyes. He opened the door of the tower and called to the prisoner. Evelyn came and kneeled before him in deep sorrow and kissed his feet. What have I done, sir? that I am thus severely treated. You have made gain of me and of my ambassador, answered the king. You have boasted that if I had sent you to the fair with golden hair, you would certainly have brought her back with you. It is true, sir, rejoined Evanant, that I should have so impressed her with the sense of her, your majesty, high qualities that I feel persuaded she could not have refused you. And in saying that, sir, I urge nothing that could be disagreeable to you. The king saw clearly that Avenant was innocent. He cast an angry look upon the people who had undermined his favorite and brought him away with him, sincerely repenting the wrong he had done to him. After giving him an excellent supper, he called him into his cabinet and said to him, Avenant, I still love the fair with golden hair. Her refusal has not discouraged me, but I know not what course to take to induce her to marry me. I am tempted to send you to her to see if you could succeed. Avenant replied that he was ready to obey him in everything and that he would set up the next day. Ho, oh, said the king, I will give you a splendid team. It is unnecessary, answered Evanant. I need only a good horse and letters of credence for your majesty. The king embraced him for what he was delighted to find him prepared to start so quickly. It was on the Monday morning that he took leave of the king and of his friends to proceed on his embassy quite alone and without pomp or noise. His mind was occupied solely with schemes to induce the fair with golden hair to marry the king. 
he had a writing case in his pocket, and when a happy idea occurred to him for his introductory address, he alighted from his steed and seated himself under the trees to commit it to a paper, so that he might not forget anything. The next morning, that he had set up at his first peep of the day, in passing through a large meadow, a charming idea came into his head. He dismounted and seated himself beside some willows and poplars, which were planted along the bank of a little river that ran by the edge of the meadow. After he had made his note, he looked about him, delighted to find himself in so. Beautiful a spot. He perceived on the grass a large, gilded carp gasping and nearly exhausted, for in trying to catch some little flies, it had leaped so far out of the water that he had fallen on the grass, and was all but dead. Evelyn took pity upon it, and although it was a fast jay, and he might have carried it off for his dinner, he picked it up. And pulled it gently back into the river. As soon as my friend the carp felt the freshness of the water, she began to recover herself, and glided down to the very bottom, then rising again joyously to the bank of the stream. Avenant says she, "I thank you for the kindness you have done me. Before you, I should have died. You have saved me." I will do as much for you. After this little compliment, she dived down again into the water, leaving Evelyn much surprised at her intelligence and great civility. Another day, as he continued his journey, he saw a crowd in great distress. The poor bird was pursued by a large eagle, which had nearly caught it, and would have swallowed it like. Lentil, if Evelyn had not felt compassion for his misfortune, thus he cried, "Do the storm oppress the weak? What right has the eagle to eat the crow?" He seized his bow and arrow, which he always carried with him, and taking a good aim at the eagle, whiz! He sent the shaft right through his body. It fell dead, and the crow in rapture. Came and perched on a tree. Avenant, he cried to him, "It was very generous of you thus to secure me. I am, I who am only a poor crow, but I will not be ungrateful. I will do as much for you." Avenant admired the good sense of the crow, and resumed his journey. Entering a great wood so early in the morning. That there was scarcely light enough for him to see his road, he heard an owl screeching, like an owl in despair. "Hey, day," said he, "here's an owl in great affliction. It has been caught, perhaps, in some net. He searched on all sides, and at last discovered some large nets, which had been spread by fathers during the night to catch small birds. What a pity!" Say he, that men are only made to torment each other, or to prosecute poor animals which do them no wrong or mischief. He drew his knife and cut the cords. The owl took flight, but returning swiftly on the wing, Avenant he cried, "It is needless for me to make a long speech to enable you to comprehend the obligation I am under to you." It speaks plainly enough for itself. The hunters would soon have been here. I have been taken. I have been dead. But for your assistance, I have a grateful heart. I will do as much for you. These were the three most important adventures which befell Evan on his journey. He was so eager to reach the end of it that he lost no time in repairing to the palace of the fair with golden hair. Everything about it was admirable. There were diamonds to be seen in heaps, 
as though they were pebbles. Fine clothes, sweet meats, money, the most wonderful sight that ever was seen. And Evelyn thought in his heart, if he could persuade the princess to leave all this to go to the king, his master, he should be very lucky indeed. He dressed himself in a suit of brocade, with plum of carnation and white feathers, combed it and powdered himself, washed his face, put a richly embroidered scarf round his neck, with a little basket, and in it. A beautiful little dog, which he had barked as he came to Bologna. Evelyn was so handsome, so amiable, and did everything with so much grace, that when he presented himself at the palace gate, the guards saluted him most respectfully, and they ran to inform the fair with golden hair. The Evelyn, ambassador from the king, her nearest neighbor. Requested to be present to her. In the name of Evelyn, the princess said, "That betokens something agreeable to me. I will wager he is a pretty fellow, and pleases everybody." Yes, in sooth, madam, exclaimed all her maids of honor. We saw him from the loft in which we were dressing your flax, and as long as he remained under the windows, we could do no work. Very pretty," replied the fair with golden hair, "amusing yourselves with looking at young men. Here, give me my grand gown of blue embroidered satin, and arrange my fair hair very tastefully. Get me some garlands of fresh flowers, my high heel shoes, and my fan. Let them sweep my presence chamber, and thus my throne, for I." We have him declare everywhere that I am truly the hair with golden hair. Sorry, the fair with golden hair. All her women hastened to attire her like a queen. They were in such a hurry that they ran against each other and made scarcely any progress. At length, however. The princess passed into the great gallery of mirrors to see if anything was wanting, and then ascended her throne of gold, ivory, and ebony, which emitted a perfume like balsam, and commanded her maids of honor to take their instruments and sing very softly, so as not to confuse anyone. Evelyn was ushered into the hall of audience. He was so struck with admiration that he has since declared frequently that he could scarcely speak. Nevertheless, he took courage and delivered his oration to perfection. He beseeched the princess that he might not have the mortification of returning without her. Gentle Evelyn, she replied, "The arguments you have adduced are all." Of them exceedingly good, and I assure you, I should be very happy to favor you more than another. But you must know that about a month ago, I was walking by the riverside with all my ladies in the waiting, and in pulling off my glove in order to take some refreshment that was served me, I drew from my finger a ring, which unfortunately fell into the stream. I value it more than my kingdom. I leave you to imagine the grief its loss occasioned me. I have made a vow never to listen to any offers of marriage. If the ambassador who proposes the husband does not restore to, my, to me my ring, you now see therefore what you have to do in this matter. For though you should talk to me for a fortnight, night and day, you will never persuade me to change my mind. Evelyn was so was so much surprised at this answer, he made the princess a low bow, and begged her to accept the little dog, the basket, and the scarf. But she replied that she would receive no presents, and bade him go and reflect on what she had said to him. 
When he returned to his lodgings, he went to bed without eating any supper, and his little dog, whose name was Cabriole, would take none himself and went and lay down beside his master. All night long, Evan never ceased sighting. Where can I hope to find a ring that fell a month ago into a great river? Say he. It would be folly to attempt looking for it. The princess only lent this condition to me because she knew it was impossible for me to fulfill it. And then he sighed again and was very sorrowful. Cap Royal, who heard him, said, My dear master, I entreat you not to despair of your good fortune. You are too amiable not to be happy. Let us go to the riverside as soon as it is daylight. Evelyn gave him two little pats without saying a word and worn out with grieving and fell asleep. Cabriole, as soon as he saw daybreak, frisked about so that he woke Evelyn and said to him, Dress yourself, master, and let us go out. Evelyn was quite willing. He rose, dressed and descended into the garden, and from the garden strayed mechanically towards the river, on the banks of which he strode with his head pulled over his eyes and his arms folded, thinking only of taking his departure, when suddenly he heard himself called by his name, Avenant, Avenant. He looked all around him and could see nobody. He thought he was dreaming. He resumed his walk, when again the voice called, Avenant, Avenant. Who calls me, he asked. Cabriole, who was very little and was looking close down the water, replied, Never trust me if it be not a golden carp that I see you. Immediately the carp appeared on the surface and said to Avenant, You saved my life in the needle, tree meadow, though, where I must have perished but for your assistance. I promise to do as much for you. Here, dear Avenant, is the ring of the fair with golden hair. Avenant stooped and took the ring out of his friend the carp's mouth, whom he tanked a thousand times. Instead of returning to his lodgings, he went directly to the palace, followed by little Cabri Ole, who was very glad he had induced his master to take a walk by the riverside. The princess was informed that Avenant requested to see her. Alas, Poor youth, said she, he is come to take leave of me. He is convinced that I require an impossibility, and he is about to return with these tidings to his master. Evelyn was introduced and presented her with the ring, saying, Madam, I have obeyed your commands, while it please you to accept the king, my master, for your husband. When she saw her ring quite perfect, she was so astonished, so astonished, that she thought she was dreaming. Really, she said, Courteous Avent, you must be favored by a fairy, for by nature means this is impossible. Madam, he answered, I am not acquainted with any fairy, but I was very anxious to obey you. As you are so obliging, continued she, you must do me another service, without which I never will be married. There is a prince, not far from here, named Galifron, who has taken it into his head he will make me his wife. He declared to me his determination, accompanying it by the most terrible traits, that if I refuse him, he will lay waste my kingdom. But judge if I could accept him. He is a giant taller than a high tower. He eats a human. A man, as a monkey, is a chestnut. 
When he goes into the country, he carries in his pockets small cannons, which he uses for pistols. And when he speaks very loud, those who are near him become deaf. I sent word to him that I did not wish to marry, and that he must accuse me. But he has never ceased to persecute me. He kills all my subjects, and before anything can be done, you must fight him, and bring me his head. Evanum was a little astounded at this proposition. He mused for a few minutes upon it, and then answered, "Well, madam." I will fight Galifron. I believe I shall be conquered, but I will die as becomes a brave man. The princess was much surprised at his determination. She said a thousand things to prevent his undertaking the adventure. It was of no use. He withdrew to seek for weapons and everything else he might re- require. When he had made his preparations. He replaced little Cabriolet in his basket, mounted a fine horse, and rode into the dominions of Galifron. He inquired about him of all he met, and every one told him he was a fairy demon, whom no vo- nobody dare approach. The more he heard of him, the more his alarm increased. Cabriolet inc- encouraged him and said, "My dear master, why fight him?" I will bite his legs. He will stoop to rid himself of me, and then can kill him easily. Avenant admired the wit of the little dog, but he knew well enough that his help could be a little avail. At length, he arrived in the neighborhood of Galifron's castle. All the roads to it were strewn with the bones and bodies of men who had been eaten or torn to pieces. He did not wait long before he saw the monsters coming through a wood. His head was visible above the highest trees, and he sang in a terrible voice, "Ho, oh, bring me some babies, fat or lean, that I may crunch them with my teeth between. I could eat so many, so many, so many, that in the wide world." There would not be left any. Upon which Evelyn immediately sang the same tune. Oh, here is Evelyn to be seen, who comes to draw your teeth, so keen. He is not the greatest man to view, but he is big enough to conquer you. The rhymes were not quite adapted to the music, but he made them in a great hurry. And it is really a miracle; they were not much worse, for he was in a desperate fright. When Galifron heard his words, he looked about him in every direction, and caught sight of Avenant, who, sword in hand, uttered several taunts to provoke him. They were needless. However, he was in a dreadful rage, and snatching up in an iron mace. He would have crushed the gentle Evan at one blow, had not a crow lighted at this instant on his head, and with his beak most accurately picked up both his eyes. The blood rained down his face, and he lay about him on all sides like a madman. Evan avoided his blows, and gave him such thrust with his sword, running it up to the hilt in his body. At last. He fell bleeding from a thousand wounds. Avenant quickly cut off his head, quite transported with joy at his good fortune, and the crow, who had perched himself on the nearest tree, said that I have not forgotten the service you rendered me in killing the eagle, which pursued me. I promise you, I will return the obligation. I trust I have done so today. I owe all to you, Monsieur Crow," replied Avenant, "and remain your obliged servant." And forthwith mounted his horse, laden with the horrible head of Galifron. When he reached the city, all the people followed him, crying, 
Behold the brave Avenant who has slain the monster, said so that the princess who heard a great uproar and who trembled lest they should come and announce to her death of Avenant. Dare not inquire what had happened, but the next moment she saw Avenant enter, bearing the giant's head, which still impressed her with terror. Although there, were, there was no longer an occasion for alarm, Madam, said Evan to the princess, your enemy is dead. I trust you will no longer refuse the king, my master. Ah, pardon me, said the fair with golden hair, but indeed I must refuse him, unless you can find means before my departure to bring me some water from the gloomy grotto. Hard by there is a deep cavern, full six leagues in extent. At the mouth of it are two dragons, who prevent anyone from entering. Flames issue from the jaws and eyes. Inside the cavern is a deep pit, into which you must descend. It is full of toads, adders, and serpents. At the bottom of this pit, there is a small cavity through which flows the mountain of health and beauty. Some of that water is must absolutely obtain. Whatever is washed with it becomes something marvelous. If persons are handsome, they remain so forever. If ugly, they become beautiful. If young, they remain always young. If old, they become young again. You may well imagine, Avenant, that I will not quit my kingdom without some of this wonderful water. Madam, he replied, you are so beautiful already that this water will be quite useless to you. But I am an unfortunate ambassador whose death you desire. I go in search of that which you conveyed with the certainty that I shall never return. The fair with golden hair was immovable, and Evelyn set out with the little dog Cabriolet to seek in the gloomy grotto the water of beauty. Everybody who met him on the road exclaimed, This a pity to see so amiable a youth wantonly court destruction. He goes alone to the grotto when even if he had a hundred men to back him up, he could not accomplish his object. Why would the princess only demand impossibilities? Avenant passed on without saying a word, but he was in very low spirits. Having nearly got to the top of a mountain, he sat down to rest a little, allowing his horse to graze and cabriolet to run after the flies. He knew that the gloomy grotto was not far from that spot, and looked about to see if he could discover it. He perceived a horrible rock, as black as ink, out of which issued a thick smoke, and the next minute one of the dragons casting out fire from his mouth and eyes. It had a green and yellow body, great clothes, and a long tail, coiled round in more than a hundred foes. Cabriolet saw all this, and was so frightened he did not know where to hide himself. Avenant, perfectly prepared to die, drew his sword and descended towards the cavern, with a fowl which the fair with golden hair had given him to fill the water of beauty. He said to his little dog Cabri Ole, It is all over with me. I shall never be able to obtain the water which is guarded by those dragons. When I'm dead, fill the fowl with my blood and carry it to the princess, that she may see what she has cost me. Then go to the king, my master, and tell him my sad story. As he uttered his words, he heard a voice calling, 
Avenant, Avenant. Who calls me? He asked, and he saw an owl in the hole of an old tree, who said to him, "You let me out of the fowler's net in which I was caught, and saved my life. I promise I would do you as good a return. And now, in the time, give me your fowl. I'm familiar with all the windings in the gloomy grotto. I will fetch you some of the water of beauty." Oh, I leave you to imagine who was delighted. Avenant, quickly, handed the fowl to the owl, and saw it enter the grotto, without the least difficulty. In less than a quarter of an hour, the bird returned with the fowl full of water, and tightly stopped. Avenant was in ecstasies. He thanked the owl heartily, and reascending the mountain. Joyfully to his way back to the city, he went straight to the palace and presented the fowl to the fair with golden hair, who had no longer an excuse to make. She thanked Avenant, gave orders for everything to be got ready for her departure, and finally set out with him on the journey. She found him an exceedingly agreeable companion, and said to him more than once. If you had wished it, I would, I would have made you king, and there would have been no occasion for us to quit my dominance. But his answer was always, "I would not be guilty of such treachery to my master, for all the kingdoms of the face of the earth. Although you are to me more beautiful than the sun." At length, they arrived at the king's capital city, and His Majesty. Hearing the fair with golden hair was approaching, went to meet her, and made her the most super presence in the world. The marriage was celebrated with such great rejoicings that folks could talk of nothing else but the fair with golden hair, who secretly loved Avenant, was never happy when he was out of her sight, and was always praising him. But for Evernant, she would say to the king, "I should never have been here. For my sake, he has done impossible things. You should feel deeply indebted to him. He obtained for me the water of beauty. I shall never grow old, and I shall always remain handsome." The envious courtiers who heard the queen express herself thus say to the king. You are not jealous, and yet you have good cause to be so. The queen is so deeply in love with Avenant that she can neither eat nor drink; she can talk of nothing but him. And of the obligations you are under her to him, as if any one else it had pleased you to send to her, would not have done as much. That's quite true," said the king. Now I think of it. Let him be put in the tower, with irons on his hands and feet. Avenant was accordingly seized, and in return for his faithful service to the king, further hand and foot in a dungeon, he was allowed to see no one, but a gaoler, who threw him a morsel of black bread through a hole, and gave him some water in an earthen pan. His little dog Cabriolet, however, did not desert him, but came daily to console him and tell him all the news. When the fair with golden hair heard of Evelyn's disgrace, she flung herself at the king's feet and, bathed in tears, implored him to release Evelyn from prison. But the more she entreated her, the more angry the king became. But the more she entreated, the more angry the king became, for he thought to himself, "It is because she loves him." So he refused to stir in the matter. The queen ceased to urge him, and fell into a deep melancholy. The king took it into his head that perhaps she did not think 
him handsome enough, he longed to wash his face with the water of beauty. In hopes that the queen wouldn't then feel more affection for him, the fowl full of his water stood on the chim chimney piece in the queen's chamber. She had placed it there for the pleasure of looking at it more frequently. But one of her chambermaids, trying to kill a spider with a broom, unfortunately threw down the fowl, which broke in the fall, and all the water was lost. She swept the fragments of glass away quickly, and not knowing what to do, it suddenly occurred to her that she had seen in the king's cabinet a fowl precisely similar, full of water, as clear as the water of beauty. So, without word to anyone, she adroitly managed to get possession of it and placed it on the queen's chimney piece. The water which was in the king's cabinet was used for the execution of princess and great noblemen who were condemned to die for any crime. Instead of beheading or hanging them, their faces were rubbed with this water, which had the fatal property of throwing them into deep sleep, from which they never awakened. So it happened one evening that the king took down the fowl which he fancied contained the water of beauty, and rubbing the contains well over his face, he fell into a profound slumber and expired. The little dog, Cabriole, was the first to hear the news of the king's death, and ran with it to Avenant, who begged him to go and find a fair with golden hair and remind her of the poor prisoner. Cabriole slipped quietly through the crowd, for there was great confusion at court in consequence of the king's death, and said to the king, Madam, do not forget poor Avenant. She immediately recalled to her mind all that he had suffered on her account, and his extreme fidelity. She left the place without speaking to anyone and went directly to the tower, where, with her own hands, she took the irons off the hands and feet of Avenant and put in her crown of gold upon his head and the royal mantle over his shoulders. She said, Come, charming Avenant, I make you king and take you for my husband. He threw himself at her feet in joy and gratitude. Everybody was delighted to have him for the master. His nuptials were the most splendid that ever were seen in the world, and the fair with golden hair reigned long and happily with the handsome Avenant ever after. A kindly action never failed to do. The smallest brings a blessing back to you. When Evelyn preserved the carpet crawl, and even had compassion on the wall, of an ill omen and ill favor all, who have dreamed a fab official foe, who plays him on the pinnacle of fame, when of his king he urged the tender flame, and warned the fair he for another root, and shaken in his loyalty he stood, Innocent victim of a rival's hate, when all seemed lost, when darkest frown his fate, just providence reserve, reversed the ruthless doom, to virtue gave the throne to tyranny atoned. That's it. That's all for today. I hope you're having a wonderful sleep right now and a deep, deep dream. Goodbye, my friend. I hope to see you in the next one.